You're the guy that wrote that 38,000 word article uh, in B Business Week about code that's still reverberating. How significant do you think this is that finally there is some standardization when it comes to code? It's very significant. Uh, containerization, which means that it, it allows you to sort of split computers up and, and see them as not just virtual machines, but these sort of lovely little virtual environments that anyone can, can use. The way that this is coming together and getting standardized is, is really good. It'll make a more solid, simple set of tools, for, especially for cloud computing, for distributing apps across millions of computers. Now, what's interesting, Rod, is that you're seeing competitors come together. Obviously, Microsoft, which saw Linux as a major competitor with, you know, IBM and yeah. Oracle, you're seeing competitors get together on this. Well, it, as Paul just mentioned, this is all about productivity and how fast developers now can build their applications, be able to deploy them and manage them. So, you know, as we're doing that, cloud computing comes into this, moving things from Azure to Bluemix to Google to you know, Amazon, other places becomes a business decision. So as, as Paul laid out, this is a lot more about how people can innovate faster, package it up, put it out, and, and iterate on that process over and over again, choosing the platform that they feel like is best fit for them. Do we need more standards like this? I think from our perspective, it definitely helps because we need more engineers in general. And so if you can create standardization around what people are learning and adopting, you'll have people moving into the industry faster. Because currently the way it works is, is a lot of different people, developers, companies write in different languages, and then so how do they share information? <laughs> well, one is that, that around the container piece, it's a very big switch from where we were before, where IT shops dictated what languages you could use uh -huh. because it was so expensive. Now you can choose the right language for the right job, and inside a container, it's up to the development team to decide what that is. So, Paul, explain this to us. What do different languages do? You know, C++ is supposed to be better for games, and PHP for websites, and Python for big data and analytics. How do you decide what language to use when you're starting a company? Well, as, as Rob pointed out, it really is, it, it's a decision you want to make based on the requirements. And so if you need something very fast, if you're doing something like a game, C++ is a given because it allows you such granular control over how the computer is working. Python is lovely for building servers. What's great about the way that this containerization standard can move forward is, is that hopefully those choices become actually, uh, you can make them without as many external pressures. If Python really is the, the right tool, you can write a service and a server, deliver it in one of these containers, and people never need to know how it's running. Why are there so many different languages, Elena? Um, you know, it, it, they, they fit different needs, uh -huh. certainly, um, and then people are going to want to work in a different language depending on um, you know, what they're doing and kind of what their preference is. Uh -huh. What's interesting is there's this language, COBOL, which, which powers a lot of things like, you know, traffic lights and, and, and hospitals, airports. And yet the future of this language is very much under threat, right? Because engineers don't actually want to learn that. Paul, what do you think the future of COBOL is? You know, it's not necessarily going away. It still runs a lot of big systems. People are, uh, I personally like to learn a little bit about it every now and then just because I feel that that keeps my career safe. There's always, there's always jobs for COBOL programmers. And, you know, the truth is, honestly, any language that is well understood that people, uh, if you have a good community working with you, it's just not that bad. It, it, there was a point, I think, in the 80s and 90s where it became the evil language. And I think on, on this side of things, on this, on this side of the year 2000 problem, people are like, well, it's still here. You kind of have to give it credit just for hanging around. And this, by the way, was a language invented by Grace Hopper back in 1959. But what do you guys see as the future of COBOL? Is, is it better to maintain the beast, <laughs> even though it's outdated? Oh, no. I, I think, to, to Paul's point, COBOL does transactions. That's really what it was aimed for. And it does transactions very well. Mainframes today are modernized, just like you'd expect any other systems to for data economies. It runs many different languages today. I think that, you know where we're going with part of this is if you're going to be an engineer in the future, you've got to be, understand multi-languages. Okay. That's the key. And I'd like to learn a new language every year because I like to see what problems they're solving. I think that's the part that's interesting going forward. COBOL, right. not hard to learn. You should be able to pick that up and right. understand it. Engineers, developers, you hear that? 
learn COBOL.